Hello everyone, welcome to the Game Changers podcast. I'm Michael, this is Jeff Simon, and today we've got our first interview of the series, Josh <laughs> Allier from the Manly Sea Eagles. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, we're just going to be doing a little interview with Josh, asking him a few questions. Um, so Josh is from New Zealand. We'll start off, um, at what age did you start playing rugby league and, and what team did you first play for? So um, I'm from West Auckland, so I was playing for the Glenora Bears. I started at about um, seven or eight. I uh, just jumped in one of my um, family friends' team. Um, loved it. And then uh, just been kind of pursuing it ever since, I suppose. Awesome. Mm. You're, you're Josh. Michael's the interpreter here. <laughs> How do you actually say your last name? Aloy. Aloy. Yeah, that's perfect. I'm going to try and remember that. <laughs> So Josh, um, what position did you really um, first excel at? What did I first excel or do you know what I played at? Yeah, I well, played garbage. Believe it or not, I played in the house when I was really young. Well, I played in the house a little bit. Well, thank God that's changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then my son won genetics came and moved me into the forwards. Mm. Um, yeah, and I, so then, I, then I started playing second row lock. Um, and then anywhere in the forwards, um, I was always pretty comfortable anywhere in the forwards. I definitely prefer the middle of the park over playing on the edge. Was the game, when you were growing up, because I'm not sure, I'm, you, you'll tell us when you came here, but when you were playing in the juniors in Auckland, was it a big game? I mean, is, did a lot of young blokes play rugby league or were they aspiring to play rugby union? It was actually, uh, I think rugby league's on the rise in New Zealand big time. Yeah. Mm. Um, Good. Especially when I was going there, the, the school started really taking on rugby league, started taking rugby league more seriously. Um, I never played rugby union. I, I was always a, I was always a league boy. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like it's on the rise big time, and it has been ever since I, even I was at school and I was growing up. So. And I think that comes down probably to if the Warriors have success, right? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. You know, you hope that they do have success, so the game can grow a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, you do, because the relationship between uh, the All Blacks going so well and making them such an easy team for our country to follow, yeah, I feel like would have the same effect if the Warriors were doing so well. They'd be so easy to follow and the country would get behind yeah. them. So, yeah, I think there's a relationship there. Yeah. Josh, at what age were you first recognised and how were you recruited by Parramatta? Yeah, so I was um, I was 15 and I was playing for the um, Auckland uh, 17s team. Yeah. How this happened, it was, it was actually a bit of a story to it. So um, they actually asked me to come over straight away and, and um, relocate to Sydney, Australia, play Harold Matts. And then start working my way through, you know, SG Ball, uh, the under twenties. I think it was the Toyota Cup. So, who made that decision? Because your your family stayed in New Zealand. That's right. So you came over to Australia by yourself. But that's not what happened. So okay. they asked me if I wanted to finish that season and come over, and they offered me a four year deal. And my mum said no. Okay. So she said like. Look, so you're fifteen. Sorry, Joe, you're fifteen at this. At yeah. This, yeah. Wow. And they wanted me to move over at sixteen. Yeah. And so like my mum. Praise God that she made this decision. She said, look, you're not mature enough to move over. Mm. Um, you're not ready mentally. Like, you've got a lot to learn. And we can't argue like with your mum's still No. And some will, <laughs> some will say you're still not. <laughs> <laughs> Simon's met my mum. So, you know, so, uh, when she said, what she says goes. She is the boss. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so she actually said, no, um, you're not going over straight away. Um, play, play another year. And if the opportunity comes up again, then we'll talk about it. Very sound advice. Yeah. yeah. When you were playing at that age, yeah. were there any other players that have kicked on now that you played with or played against? When yeah, yeah. Like, we had a real competitive circuit. Like um, David Fusitor from the Warriors. Oh wow. Um, you got Tui Lolo here. Mm-hmm. Um, even top of four Sipley, who's at Manly mm-hmm. with me at the moment. Oh, he was with you over there. Yeah, yeah. Wow. He was um he was with us over in um. And Auckland and in the same system. Now we we had quite a few guys that that done real well. Jeez, it's a real big nursery, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. When you it's think huge. about it, it's huge. Yeah, we yeah. went to um, we went to competitive rugby league schools as well. So a lot of those boys are most of the boys that get through the system either go to um, St Paul's or Calston Boys High School, and um, they they're extremely competitive. Yeah, in rugby league. Like here, I suppose, but there's obviously a bigger pool. But yeah. you know, a lot of schools. You know, Patrician Brothers, uh, Blacktown, Fairfield, St. Greg's, Campbelltown. Yeah. Westfield Sports. West, Westfield yeah. Sports, yeah. It's a massive nursery. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, 
from there, um, how did you end up at the the West Tigers from New Zealand? Would you, were you got signed to Para originally? Yeah, so I got yeah. signed to Parramatta. Um, I played my junior footy there. Yeah. That, that actually went, went really well. So I played um, I played a year of SG Ball. The following mm. year, I went, uh, played 20s. That's when I, I represented the junior Kiwis. Yeah. Uh, and the year after that, I played mostly uh, reserve grade while I was training with the NRL. Yeah. So I was still uh, 18 or 19 around that time. So you played Toyota Cup for Para? Yep, yep, played Toyota Cup. And my you, were first training, year. you were training with the first grade squad. Yep, yep. After representing the Junior Kiwis. Um, did you think that you'd be playing first grade at Para? Did they give you, did they, did they dangle the carrot in front of you? I think there was times where, where it was getting close. Yeah. Um, I was 18th man a couple of times. Um, but looking back, I can just be self-aware enough to look back and say, look, I wasn't ready to play in Iran. So like I, I um I'm kind of happy that I didn't. I wasn't thrown into the deep end. It's really interesting, yeah. 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 A lot of people, a lot of blokes at that age, from my experience, would yeah. say, you know, I'm ready, 18, 19. But you know, that's it's, yeah. Don't get me wrong. At the time, I wanted to play everything. You know, I was yeah. disappointed yeah. that I hadn't. Um, but looking back, like I really didn't understand what it took to be an NRL player, and then after that, to be a good NRL player. Um, I'm really happy that. It came kind of, you know, 12 months later. What, when you say you think you weren't ready, you're talking about, obviously, the differences between under-20s, reserve grade, and NRL. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest difference between those those bottom two levels and, yeah. and first They're grade? They're a world apart. Um, mm. Being able to make decisions under fatigue. Yeah. Um, it just feels like in the NRL, you make one decision wrong under fatigue, which you always are, yeah. um, you get found out. You can get away with this and that in under-20s or in reserve grade. But you can't and then I remember. I remember watching the twenties when it was because it was going for a few years and a lot of the games were just like touch football. It was glorified touch yeah. football. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, you make a really good point with fatigue. I mean, you know, people don't realise how quick the game of rugby league is. Yeah. I mean, you obviously experience it at a really high level and you know, a lot of players make wrong decisions under mm. fatigue. That's right. It's not because they're not it's not because they don't have the ability. It's yeah. just that you know, fatigue plays an enormous part in, in decision making. Yeah, it so is. that's exactly right. So it, basically, everything you, you do at training is um, trying to make you a good decision maker under fatigue. So, but as I say, so I was at I was at um, Parramatta for those years, and in that second year of twenties, when I was playing mostly reserve grade but training with the NRL, I broke my hip. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just looked at my hip I broke my hip and Tigers uh, not Tigers uh, Parramatta kind of said look we um, we want to kind of go separate ways with you which I understood I was injured and at the same time probably not ready for NRL yeah. and that was the biggest blessing ever because the change to Tigers they I just felt like they nurtured me a lot more um, JT had uh, tons of time for me um, mm-hmm. and they developed me and then they got me to a point where I was ready to I was ready to be a first so did they approach you the West Tigers yeah so as soon as um, Parramatta said look we want to go our separate ways we said cool um, we'll go put our feelers out and um, they were pretty keen so one of the recruitment guys at, at the Tigers had watched me play for a few years yeah. and things like that and he was keen to get me on board so JT you obviously mean J- Jason Taylor yep Jason yeah. Taylor yeah was he the one that gave you the start at the Tigers he was yeah okay. not only that but he just um no, I can't speak more highly of him, honestly. Mm. Like, um, I, there's a lot of different opinions about him, but to me, he, he nurtured me and developed me from being a kid that's kind of fresh from New Zealand and not ready to play first grade within four or five months, getting me ready to be a real first grade and then going on to kind of play every game that year. Wow. Josh actually still holds the record at the West Tigers. He debuted round one in 2016 and played every game in his debut season. And no other player's ever that, done that. That really happens. It doesn't yeah, happen. No. That, now you bring that up, that actually... Can we stop giving him a rap? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even started on him. Yeah, we haven't even started on him yet. Um, so, so what did you think of of the coaches that... When you went to the Tigers, obviously Jason Taylor was there and you've had a few coaches since yeah. then. Mm. Um, and these guys probably know more... Than, than anyone and the frustration that they had <laughs> without any success and, and I say that with respect but in terms of coaches how would you I'm not going to ask you to rate them but yeah. what are the differences between you know Jason Taylor um, Cleary and, and Maguire yeah. I mean 
So for me, in terms of um, helping me become a first grader, JT because he gave me a crack. He was he was like he was monumental for me. And then growth and becoming solid and understanding the game. Um, Madge McGuire, he was he's great for me. And heaps of the principles he's actually taught me, I still use today. Heaps of the mindsets that he's kind of instilled into me, I still use in my footy. So uh, Madge, I think he's the one that's grown me and developed me the most. Wow. Yeah. You've had a lot of um, injury setbacks in your career. You've hurt your hand, knee. Um, a, a lot of people might not know you, you had to remove a, a rib muscle and and have surgery to make it um, yeah. part of your hand. Can you just give us sort of an insight into into some of the injuries you've had in your career and how you've you've managed to overcome them and and continue to play regular NRL football? Yeah, so it's really by the grace of God that when I recover from my injuries, I, I generally feel fully recovered. It's not stuff that I, I carry into games. Yep. Um, yeah, so I had to get a rib graft done because I, I ended up playing the whole year with a broken wrist. Um, after having a couple operations on it that were unsuccessful. So they took out my rib and a blood vessel, put it into my wrist and used it to kind of reconstruct my wrist. Crazy. Which has kind of come right now. And my left hook's <laughs> get moving again now. Um, yeah, injuries and setbacks, it's, um, it's funny because your body heals from injuries, but they linger in your mind. And you can, I feel like a lot of the time you've got mental injuries. Yeah. That, that yeah. Need nursing. I've heard that. When you say that, do you, if for example you've had an injury, as you say, with yeah. your wrist, and you feel that you're ready to come back, yeah. and it's it's healed, does it? But obviously, what you say is it plays on your mind. Are you cautious about using the hand, or, or I mean, yeah, I know. Exactly. I, I don't think people understand the impact that injuries do have on players. Right. Yeah. You know, th- does it play on your mind? So yeah, it plays on your mind. So, but the the time to to make sure you're ready to go, so you're not cautious in the game. You can't go play in NRL and be cautious. Yeah, you can't, yeah. Um, you can't preserve yourself in NRL. So you need to make sure at training that you've got, had a bash up. It's taken away. So you do the contact. You got to do the training. You got to do the training because if you go to the field and there's a question mark, you you're gonna let someone down. You're or you need to go to the field yeah. and say, look. It might not be good, but I'm going to throw my body at it and we'll see how it Because you'll get found out pretty quickly. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Wow. I feel like it needs to be one of the two. You've had a knock at training and you know that it's all good, or otherwise you say, I'm going to go rip in and however I end up, I end up after. Have you ever felt that you were okay mm. and you've made the wrong decision in terms of injuries? Like your body's told you that, you know, I'm ready to play, but you've sort of made a mistake of, mistake of playing and then re-injuring. Has that happened to you? Luckily, I haven't had re-injuries, but I have played with a lot of injuries that a lot of people probably tell me I shouldn't have. Okay. Yeah. He played a whole season with a broken hand, didn't you? A broken wrist. Is yeah, that... I wasn't able to pick stuff up at home or yeah. open doors or... So anything. where does that pressure come from, Josh? I mean, is it is it pressure from yourself to perform? For me personally, the way I operate, the most pressure that's put on me is always for myself. Yeah, yeah. Is, and that's that's one of the biggest demons I have to fight throughout my NRL career. But not only that, even in life, it's just the pressure you put on yourself. Because I remember when he debuted, he used to carry the ball in his left arm. Mm-hmm. And then I noticed he was carrying it in his right. And I asked him one day, how come you've swapped? He goes, oh, hands busted. Do, do you think <laughs> there are a lot of players in the NRL that think the same in yeah. your experience? Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of the guys that... Elite performers are elite because uh, their their mind is so stubborn. They set goals and you're so stubborn to, to, to keep that. And I think when you say that, it's like players that uh, at the point of their career when they retire or their mind tells them that they're okay to do it but their body doesn't and it's yeah. difficult for them yeah. to make that transition. Yeah. You yeah. know, and we've seen a lot of players do that. We've seen a lot of athletes do that. You know, can, so. can I ask Josh, have you ever played a game since your debut season where you haven't had the carryover of an injury concern where you felt 100% I can rip in and give everything without a concern? A concern, without a concern. I've always felt like uh, I'll get out there and do the job. Mm. Um, but in terms of concern, probably in my, in my first year, <laughs> um, uh, in my first year of the NRL, this is year six now. Mm. Um, 
yeah, your body's kind of a little bit fresh, hasn't taken yeah. as much wind here. But after that, um, you kind of just learn that um, you just need a, uh, there's just certain di- different things you need to deal with. Yeah. But when it crosses over to you possibly not being able to do your job, you need to put your hand up and say, I can't do the job for my team. Yeah. Because otherwise it's selfish. That's true. Yeah. Uh, J- uh, Josh, you, you know, born and raised in New Zealand, but you also have a very proud Samoan heritage. Yeah. And I think it was 2017 you first represented Samoa. Yeah. What does that mean to you um, to represent your, I guess, your heritage? Uh, that, was, that was definitely one of the highlights of my career. Mm. Uh, I, I love that. Um, to represent my dad's side, um, my Samoan family were really proud of me back home. Is your mum uh, Samoan as well? No, nah, my mum's European. She's oh. Kiwi. Yeah. Oh, she's okay. Kiwi. And and dad's Samoan. So, um, yeah, I can remember crying during the anthem. I can remember um, doing the sivata, which is our haka, mm. and I was ready to rip people's heads off. So in two seven, so that's two seven eight. Is that right? Yeah. That you yeah. rip it? Who, who was in that team? Just like yeah, we, we had a decent yes. team. Like we had um, Milford, Cassiano, um, George Safua. Uh, yeah, we, we we had a decent team. We played Tonga. We played Tonga in Cameroon. Okay, okay. Yeah, and then, uh, uh, massive, massive. The, the growth of the Pacific nations, Samoa, Tonga, Papua New Guinea, and Fiji. It, it's unbelievable. It's it's so good for yeah. for Test football because just watching Australia, New Zealand, and England. It's, it's well, mate. Yeah. Can I tell you? I, I get more enjoyment because our expectation is for Australia to win. Yeah. yeah. But I actually get more enjoyment watching the Pacific Nations 100%, play. 100%. Same. Because same. they just throw everything into it. Yeah. And that's no disrespect to, to Australia because mm. that's who we follow, for me anyway. But with Lebanon, even mm. with watching Lebanon, like yeah. I, I, I was born here. Mm. Right? My, my, my family's been here for 60 years. But when Lebanon played in the World Cup, I mean, mm. I've got to tell you, I went to the Sydney Football Stadium to watch them in Australia and I've never experienced yeah. Yeah. an atmosphere yeah. in my whole life. And it was just, it was fantastic. Yeah. And just the competitiveness of the Pacific Nations teams and, you know, there's a bit of niggle and you, yeah. you love yeah. that sort of stuff and that's what we want to see. There's just a bit of added passion, I feel yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Sivatals and the Anthems and the Huckers, yeah, there's just... Um, that it just changes the whole atmosphere of the game. Yeah, I think as well, that we went to, uh, we, we watched you play a couple of years ago for Samoa at, at Leichhardt and the game yeah, before, yeah. Yeah. game before that was, was Fiji versus Lebanon. Yeah. And just watching some of the, especially in the Fijian, the, the Fijian talent, that there was a lot of players that played in that game that, that were local, that were from Fiji. Yeah, um, that was actually that. Coming yeah. and playing. Yeah, yeah. And just... Seeing some of the natural athletic ability, you just think if some of these guys get a chance in the NRL system, just get their bodies right, they would yeah. they would thrive. I think there's so much more that can still be done with it's with getting some of these talent. Because yeah. when I played, and I played at an elite level, I played for Belgium. C grade. I'm 53, and I, I mean I'm talking 30 years ago, and I'm, I'm not saying this without any exaggeration. In all the years that I played, I can only ever remember playing against one Pacific Island player yeah. in, in the whole competition. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, I'm talking 25, 30 years ago. We look now and it's just littered with just mm. this... Pol- and, but just the skill level mm. and, and what they bring to the game, I think, is just unbelievable. Yeah. But with that, Josh, and yeah. it comes a lot of pressure because yeah. Simon raised it earlier off air, um, the pressures and the demands from family, how how big is that? Yeah, it's huge. And, and it's a topic that, that we could talk about for a long time, but like that's, that's one of the things culturally that I really, really dislike is, mm-hmm. is the pressure that families put on um, these kids or young men uh, to make the NRL or uh, whatever sporting field it is, there's just so much added pressure. It's um, it's and that's a cultural thing. Yeah, like it is. It is a cultural thing. You see it so much in, in our Pacific Island nations, and um, families need to start changing that. They need to take the pressure off kids and let them be kids. Let them play football. No, um, there's just it's chaotic enough to go to training and fight for your jersey. Go to training and get flogged and work hard. 
go to training and try to work your way through the ranks. Through the ranks. And then you've got the added stress and chaos of your family saying, you have to make it, you have to make it, you're our way out. Wow. Mm. Uh, it, needs, uh, it really needs to stop because there's so much, there's, I've played with so many guys that have been under that pressure and they've lost, lost their love for the sport. Well, I think because if they're just supporting their family primarily and then themselves, it'd be really hard to withhold that, that passion for so long when you're not seeing any reward from it. Yeah, and it's not just probably a monetary reward, Simon. It yeah. wouldn't be just about money, yeah. but just the reward, Josh, of the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm playing a game that I love. I'm getting paid to do yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, I just want to enjoy it. Yeah, that's right. You know, like, and, I, and, and from what you're saying is that's been taken away from them to a certain extent. I'm, I don't know if it happens in, with every player, but I, I guess, yeah, just, you make some really interesting points and, and it needs to be... You know, it needs to be put out there. Mm. You know, and people need to understand that. You know, it's really it's only a game. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you know, if you're lucky enough, you can make a living out of it. But yeah. let's think about it. You know, there's only thirty positions available in every yeah, squad, yeah. isn't there? Mm. Yeah. So, Josh, you you spent five seasons at the West Tigers. Um, at the end of 2020, uh, you moved to Manly. Yeah. Uh, for someone who, you know, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, does a, a huge amount of community service stuff that yeah. a lot of people wouldn't probably know about and you don't want them to know about, you become front and back page news because you decided you weren't happy um, with the offer the West Tigers gave you and mm. you saw happiness for yourself at Manly. Um I know for a fact that in uh, Josh and I, uh, Josh and I are very good friends. Um, I know, and we speak most days. You know the undisclosed details. You can say that. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> I know when Josh was negotiating his previous contract that he stayed for less money at the Tigers than he could have got from another Sydney club. We'll just say. Mm -hmm. So. It was pretty tough for me to hear about the disloyalty shown by Josh. And mm. for someone, as I said, who's never going to be involved in any scandal, who could have played 220 NRL games and retired and not received maybe the notoriety of others, um, to be front and centre of, a, I suppose, it's sort of a scandal. Yeah. Was, that, was that tough for you? It was. Um, it was it, sorry, it was, it was tough for me just being yeah. your mate. Yeah, because I just thought, yeah. wow, this poor guy. Mm. Yeah, it was um, even my family as well. Just seemed um, like the, I had a character assassination job done on my name. Yeah, um, you did. And then there, there was so many different ways that I could have dealt with it. I mm. could have gone into a media a media fist fight with him. Mm. Um, I could have been more petty about it on my social media. But yeah. while I was emotional, while everything was hitting the fan. Mm. Um, me and you talk about shit in the fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As a dude. Yeah, as a dude. Um, I told myself I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make a decision on how I want to respond to this while I'm emotional, yeah. while I'm angry, while I'm frustrated, while mm. it's all it's all fresh emotion. Yeah. So I took the time to think about it. Um, and I think the latest interview I I done was only a month or so ago, mm. and they asked me, oh, what do, what do you want to say? And all I had to say was that um, the way I departed, the lies that were spread, and everything like that is not going to encompass my whole stay at Tigers. That's mm. not how I'm going to look at nearly playing 100 games for the Tigers. Yep. I'm not going to um, be angry because a few people done the wrong thing. Yep. Instead, I'm going to look back and say, look, I played, I played 90 games at the West Tigers. Uh, I loved it. While I was there, I got married. While I was there, I had a son. While I was there, I bought a house. Mm. Um, I was also able to help my family in numerous ways. That's that's how I'm going to go. So I'm going to say thank you for the time there. Um, can I just say something? Else? Sorry, yeah. Josh. Can I just say something? Yeah. I mean, I don't know you. This is the first time I've met you, but Simon and I are very good friends, and he has spoken very highly of you. But and I'm not going to urinate in your pocket here. <laughs> but he, I just want to say one thing to you, and it might mean much, but. The way that you've come across and the way that I've seen you handle this and what you've just said, I think it's very mature. A lot of players and a lot of sports people could take note of what you're saying and how you've dealt with it because it would have been really easy for you 
yeah. to come out and play that media game. Mm. But I thought you've handled yourself admirably. You've been honest. You've been up front. And you can hold your head really high, mate. Yeah, and I don't give compliments sure. to too many people. No, he doesn't. <laughs> Trust me, he doesn't. I'm still <laughs> waiting for my first one. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, no, mate, I, I think you've handled yourself beautifully yeah. because there's a lot of stuff that you could have come out and, you know. But, mate, ultimately, you've got to look after yourself. You have yeah. a family to look yeah. after. You, you're, you're in the game for a short period of time. And whilst, as supporters... We want to see our players stay at the club and our favourite players stay at yeah. the club. It just doesn't happen anymore, yeah. you know. And you know, I was actually I actually asked Simon the other day, and um, I said it, it'd be hard for for Simon and his family because they know you and they follow yeah. the West Tigers. But he still keeps, and he will continue to keep a massive interest in what you do, yeah. just because you're wearing a different jersey. Above anything else, he's a mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and that's the key. Hmm. Yeah, well, we're, we're like family. We always say that. They're my Italian branch of family. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I do appreciate that because um, even even Simon knows when it was all happening, I was getting calls from Lara Pert or Daniel Wilder and saying, mm-hmm. "Look, we know a lot more's going on. Let's let's hit your side of the story." And that's what I mean by I needed to take time to make a good decision. Well, I was very tempted, and Simon yeah. didn't give me all the details, but, yeah. you know, for me, it was like a character ex- assassination. I, and I try, like, I get on the radio quite a bit, and, yeah. you know, I'd like to voice my opinion, <laughs> and, you know, people think that I'm a bit over the top, but, you know, uh, I'm very passionate about a lot of things, and I was very tempted to get on there and, and try and defend you, but I don't know you, so that was a bit difficult for me. But just watching and listening to Simon and all of that sort of stuff was... And they do it to a lot of players. It's just not you, Josh. I mean, there are a lot of players and, you know, know, we've had this conversation before and, you know, journalists have got their agendas and, Mm. you know, they pick their targets and, you know, if you're you're in bed with them or if you're good with them, they won't target you. But if you don't conform, you become the scapegoat. That's true. So Josh, away from rugby league, um, I know you're you're a keen boxing enthusiast. Yeah, um, we, we see a lot. <laughs> we see um, we see a lot of um, rugby league players step into the ring, um, and by the time they step out, we realise they probably shouldn't have stepped in in the first place. <laughs> yeah. um, is that something you'd consider pursuing when you retire from rugby league? Would you would you devote enough time to take it? Seriously? Yeah. Um, so, like, as you know, like, I've been boxing since I was a kid. Mm. Uh, my brothers have been boxing. We've been boxing since we were little. We grew up in either jiu-jitsu gym or the boxing gym. Yep. Um, so I love combat sport. Um, and saying that, after football, uh, I don't want to... I don't want to pursue boxing. Okay. But now, uh, I do. I do. I, I want to start fighting in the off-seasons. The last three off-seasons, I've had operations. You know, yep. the last two on my wrist and my knee so I haven't been able to fight the last three off seasons in a perfect world I would have had three or four fights in the last um, mm. couple so, of years so you would do it while you were playing football I prefer but you, do you, you, you obviously don't want to do it because you have a family and you just you might be a yeah. bit older than yeah, that's yeah. Right. after football I think like I want to know when, when to call a time on competitive sport I don't okay. want to be um, yeah I, I don't want to be old and getting punched in the head I just want to mm. when I retire from rugby league I think I just I just want to do family, like really, okay. that's what I want to do. Okay, so when you do hang up the boots uh, from rugby league, uh, we hear a lot, a lot about players who seemingly get lost and don't know what they're going yeah. to do. Or what are your career plans in the future? What do you see yourself doing? Yeah, so if you don't mind me, uh, my, my business is, uh, I've just started my business. Mm-hmm. It's called um, Life Happens. So it's just. Um, so are you paying for this? It's part of what I'm doing at the moment, where I'm going into schools and speaking about uh, real world issues, um, talking about things like resilience and um, overcoming um, overcoming oh, obstacles. Didn't know that. Um, a whole lot of things. So I've only um, everything's just fully come through this week. So I'm registered and ready to go. And I'm gonna just start awesome. doing things around that. Things where I can give back. Um, Obviously, I'm a devoted Christian as well, so where I can speak about faith at certain schools, I, I would like to do that. And um, yeah, me and Simon got some things in the pipeline as well for later on, um, which we can't tell you. That's it, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Cause no, yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah. Yeah. Mate, you talk to a lot of players, and you know, and you, you see it a lot more than what you do, but uh, what we do. But 
you know, some players think that footy's just going to last for a long time and yeah. they don't have a plan B or a plan C and it's just, it's fantastic to, and it's refreshing to hear that you've got those plans and more importantly, it's about helping people yeah. and giving back to That's what, right. right, because rugby league's obviously, you know, giving you something, yeah, exactly. you know, and you've got an opportunity, you've got a profile. Mm. A platform. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. All right, we'll wrap it up there. So thank you, Josh, for, for coming on the show. Um, our next episode, we're actually going to have a, another special guest on. So, um, if we can have, a, we might have a preview um, right now. Let it rip. We'll leave it at that. Um, we'll see you next time. That's a snippet. <laughs>